Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Revelation. This is our third sermon in our series on Revelation. It is Revelation 6, 1 through 8, and you can find that in your New Testaments and page 248 and follow along there. Now, we skipped ahead from where we were last week. John of Patmos has had this vision from God who gave him a message to send to each of the seven major churches in Asia. We talked about that last week. And then after that, the vision continued with all sorts of interesting and mysterious creatures, four living creatures um, who don't get much of a description beyond that, appear to him, and Jesus appears as the Lamb, and uh, there are seven seals that are given to these four creatures, and they begin to break open the seals and read what happens um, when each of those seals is broken. So that's where we jump in, in Revelation 6, verses 1 through 8. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures call out, as with a voice of thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come! And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another. And he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a day's pay, and three quarts of barley for a day's pay, but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed with him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence, and by the wild animals of the earth. Let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A man from the East Coast was on a business trip here in Texas, and during the course of his trip, the Texans he encountered never failed to point out to him how things are bigger here in Texas. The sky is bigger, the houses are bigger, the cars are bigger, businesses are bigger, and so on. Well, after a few days of hard work, he went back to his hotel, which was bigger. And before going up to his room, he stopped in at the hotel bar for a couple of drinks. They were bigger, too. And so after a while, he asked the bartender where the nearest restroom was, and the bartender said, it's all the way down that hall, the last door on your right. Well, the man set off down the Texas-sized hall towards the restroom, but he'd had a couple of Texas-sized drinks already, so when he got to the end of the hallway, he was confused, and he took a left instead of a right. And that door led to the swimming pool. Now, it was an ordinary-sized swimming pool, but he didn't realize his mistake, and when he stumbled through the door, he fell splash into the cold water. And in that moment, in his panic and his confusion with all of the Texas-sized this and that floating around in his head, the businessman yelled out in complete and desperate fear to anyone who could hear him, Please don't flush! I think the book of Revelation can be like that sometimes. There are some strange and scary things in there, and we tend to blow them out of all sense of realistic proportion. 
Today we are going to talk about the famous or infamous Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. There have been volumes written about these Four Horsemen. Biblical commentaries, works of fiction, poetry, there we go, and of course attempts to decode exactly who they are and what they mean. If you do a Google search, for example, on the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, I did this yesterday, you will come up with 3,400,000 results and then some. And yet, for all that fascination that we have for these characters, they only occupy eight short verses in the book of Revelation, not even a whole chapter. So what makes these four horsemen of doom such larger-than-life figures? And should we be worried today or tomorrow about what it is that they represent? My own first encounter with the Force Horsemen, and for that matter with the book of Revelation, was unfortunately not from reading the Bible. It was when I was 14 years old and I watched a movie called A Thief in the Night and its sequel, A Distant Thunder. Now, these movies were long before the Left Behind series of movies and books, but it was the same basic concept. In these movies, which were made in the 1970s, there was a rapture that made all the true Christians disappear from the earth, and that was followed by all sorts of wars and plagues and famine and disease, and then the one that really got to me, the execution of all those who failed to obey the government mandate put out by the Antichrist who had become the world leader and to get the sign of the Antichrist. Now, that execution was by way of a very menacing-looking guillotine. You remember those, right? Slice your head off. So that film worked like magic on me. I became a Christian all over again. And I promised Jesus that I would believe, I would go to church, I would be good and never, ever disobey my parents again. And that lasted for almost an entire week. I think that probably scaring people into the kingdom of God is not a very good long-term strategy. And honestly, I don't really think that's what John was trying to do when he wrote the book of Revelation. He wasn't trying to scare people into the kingdom. He was writing about some very scary stuff that he saw happening around him in his own time. Now, I said last week that the book of Revelation offers a timeless message that speaks to everyone in every age. But if you have to place Revelation in some specific time period, we tend to place that in the future, the near future. And I would say if you have to put it in a time period, put it in the past, in the first century when it was written. We're going to go back to that past in a minute, but we're going to go even further back than that because when John of Patmos wrote Revelation, he too was looking back into the past and the history of his own people. John wrote in the tradition of the Old Testament prophets. And he looked back to their writings as a model and inspiration for his. In particular, he was looking back to the Old Testament, to the prophet Zechariah. I'm going to read to you just a few verses from the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament. And this should sound a little familiar. Zechariah 6, 1 through 5. This is Zechariah describing a vision from God. And again I looked up and saw four chariots coming out from between two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second chariot black horses, the third chariot white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled gray horses. And the Hebrew word used for dappled gray in Greek is the same word as the word for green. Then I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? The angel answered me, These are the four winds of heaven going out after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. So both of the visions, the one in Revelation and the earlier one in Zechariah, both describe celestial horses in four different colors who ride out from heaven to different parts of the earth. 
There are other things, too, that Zechariah and John have in common, even though they are separated by over 600 years in time. Zechariah wrote his book in the 6th century BC, after the Israelites had finally returned to Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile. God had finally answered the prayer of Zechariah's people, the longing of their heart to return to their home. Their dream had finally come true to rebuild their temple and worship in the land of their ancestors. John, on the other hand, wrote his book in the first century AD after the long-awaited Messiah, Jesus Christ, had finally come to Israel. After the hopes and dreams of all those who followed him came true in his resurrection and his ascension into heaven. So John and Zechariah are unique in that they both lived just long enough to see what happens after, happily ever after. And what they found is that sometimes it's not so happy. In Zechariah's time, the Israelites were allowed to return to their home and rebuild their temple, but not as an independent nation the way they thought it would happen. They were still under the control and the authority of the Persian Empire. And in John's time, his people were, as we've seen before, under the control and authority of the Roman Empire. Now, Zechariah and his people were constantly frustrated and persecuted in their efforts to rebuild the temple. And while they were ultimately successful in rebuilding it, John, in his day, witnessed the final destruction of that same temple by the Romans just 20 years before he wrote the book of Revelation. Zechariah and John both saw their dreams come true and then they saw those dreams turn into nightmares. So it should come as no surprise that both books, Zechariah and Revelation, include a healthy dose of the wrath of God, always directed at the earthly powers who oppressed their people. Keeping that historical context in mind, let's actually take a look at our four horsemen and what they represent. Verses 1 and 2. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures call out, as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. All right, so the first horse is a white horse, and that's kind of surprising since we tend to associate the color white in the Bible with purity and goodness, right? The white good guy wears the white hat, and so Jesus himself was described just a few chapters earlier in the book of Revelation as having white robes and white hair. And that instinct to see the color white symbolically as a good color may actually be a really good instinct to follow in this case. While some interpreters of the Bible call this horseman conquest and lump him together with the other three horsemen as a killing machine, I'm not so sure about that. Because there's another theory. And that theory is that this white horseman represents Christ himself, riding out to lead the other three. He wears a crown, king of kings, and he carries a bow. Now the bow we think of as an instrument of war, but many times when the bow appears in the Bible, it is also a sign of a covenant, an agreement, like the rainbow that God puts in the sky over Noah. As far as the language about conquering and conquest, remember that's exactly the same language we heard last week in the letters written to each of the churches. For example, the church in Ephesus, the message is to everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. So that's a good thing. And we have to remember that in the book of Revelation, conquering doesn't have the same sense as it does in our modern language of defeating or repressing militarily. It has the sense of overcoming challenges and obstacles. Biblical follow, scholars who follow this interpretation of the white horse tend to call him victory 
instead of conquest. All right, the next horseman, however, does not seem quite so friendly. Verses 3 and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come! And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that people would slaughter another, and he was given a great sword. Now this horse is usually named warfare, or violence. But the passage, if you listen to the wording about permitting the horseman to take peace away, it implies that peace is something that is taken and therefore given by God and God alone. And the also equal implication in this is that the default behavior of human beings when left to their own devices is to slaughter each other, but God offers or withdraws peace as the solution to our primal violent nature. Verses 5 and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's pay, and three quarts of barley for a day's pay. But do not damage the olive oil and the wine. All right, so the third horseman is, the black horseman is usually identified as famine or poverty. Wheat and barley are staples. They're necessary for the poor and for the masses to stay alive. And they're offered here at unaffordable prices. A day's worth of grain for an entire day's worth of wages, which doesn't leave much left over for other things. On the other hand, olive oil and wine, luxury foods for the rich, are safe. And this could be seen as an attempt on the part of the book of Revelation to highlight a gap between rich and poor in John's time. We certainly are familiar with those gaps in our own. And now the final horseman, verses 7 through 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed with him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence, and by the wild animals of the earth. This horseman, the green horseman, is the only one actually given a name in the scripture passage, and it's Death. Great name. Incidentally, and in case you're tempted to take this too literally and not symbolically, notice that death is followed by Hades, who as a Greek god seems a little bit out of place in a Christian vision. This is not Satan, who other places in the, in the New Testament almost universally refer to as, uh, uh, as the diabolos, or the devil. This is simply the Greek mythological god Hades. Now John certainly didn't believe in the existence of the Greek gods. So I think we are intended to see this as symbolism, just reinforcing the identity of that final horseman, death. Even if we assume that the first horseman is the victorious Christ, we're still left with three pretty scary, pretty imposing figures representing between them war and violence, poverty and famine, and disease and death. Those are all frightening things to us. And yet, they're all things that have been with us for a long, long time in every single generation. And so Christians throughout history have tended to look at what's going on around them, look at the wars and the natural disasters and the poverty and the diseases and say, we must be living in the end times. It's all coming true, just like John predicted. So let's take a look at that. The question that uh, one of the congregants in the early service said, is the world going to hell in a handbasket? Let's take a look at that. But the charts and graphs that I'm about to show you are a way of looking 
back a little bit longer than we usually do. When we turn on the news and we see hyped up frantic messages about how bad things are, what we don't get is a sense of longer perspective. So first chart I want to show you, um, actually we're going to take a look at how we're doing, how that red horseman is doing with warfare and violence. This is a graph representing violent deaths in prehistoric societies. This is just from archaeological digs and excavations, remnants, remains, and historical records, right? So it's not necessarily all the violent deaths in each of these prehistoric societies that are listed below, but it's the ones that we have evidence of. And there are a whole lot of violent deaths in prehistoric societies. Some of these date as far back as 10,000 years before the time of Christ, and some are more recent, right up to around and even after the death of Christ. But look at the red bar right out here. That's the average of all of the violent deaths in all prehistoric societies. And then the bar that comes next to it that you can barely see because it's a little blue blip is all of the violent deaths in Europe and the United States in the 20th century. And then the little blue bar that's bigger but still very small compared to everything else is violent deaths in the entire world in the 20th century. Oh, and then right after that, the very last one is violent deaths in the year 2005. You can't even see it. It's not to say there weren't any violent deaths. There certainly were, but look at it in perspective of uh, very violent times that we are coming from. Likewise, this is just the 20th century. So take that little blue bar and expand it out. And what you have, these are worldwide battle deaths. In other words, warfare, people who died from warfare. In the 1940s, of course, you have World War II, and so that's very high. And then after that, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, you have the Vietnam War, followed in the 80s by the Gulf Wars, 90 in, the, in Afghanistan, the 2000s, uh, almost barely even registers. Again, not to say that there weren't battle deaths, but if you take them in perspective, they are very much on the decrease. All right, here's another one. Europe, of course, dating back from 1300 to the 1900s, violence incredibly down. This is America um, in its entirety of its existence. Estimated long-term trend in American homicide rate. So this is just homicides. And uh, it's estimated because this is just putting together what we do know from historical records. You can see a couple of blips. There's the American Revolution, there's the Civil War, um, and even in the 20th century, there's World War II right there. But even with all of those things, there's a clear pattern of decline in homicide in America. This is violent, this is not even death. This is just violent crime in the United States, and this only goes back to 1986. So just in the last 40 or 50 years, we still see the same overall decrease. This one goes right up to the year 2020. All right, let's take a look at famine and poverty and see how that black horseman is doing these days. This is wheat yields in developing countries because remember our scripture talked about grain and the price of grain. So just going back only to 1950, this is not developed countries, this is developing countries, the yields of grain each year up to the 2000s is steadily increasing while at the same time the price for those grains worldwide is falling and this one goes all the way back to 1857 and up to the year 2012 you can see some spikes and some dips but you see a pattern that we are producing more and more grain more and more food and the price is less and less it's more and more affordable how about famine malnutrition. These are global deaths from protein energy malnutrition by age. And um, so what you see going back from 1990 up into 2015 is again some spikes, some dips, but the same pattern of decline. Fewer people in our world are dying from malnutrition or famine. It's still there, right? And the, the different colors indicate different ages of people who are dying, so there's certainly still work to be done. But if you put things in a longer perspective, we're actually doing pretty well here. 
This is the poverty rate from 1800, the global poverty rate from 1800 to today. This is the number of people in the world who are living on less than $2 a day, and it is adjusted for inflation going back to 1800. So in 1800, 85% of the world lived on the equivalent today of less than $2. And now in 2017, or at least back in 2017, it was 9% and still falling. Okay, this is a very specific one. This is wages, right? But this is wages for one industry that we have records going back quite a while for, the construction industry. So people who build things, um, we have records going all the way back to uh, the 13th century. And what you see is it kind of steady for a while, but right around the 18 and 1900s, those wages shot up astronomically and show no sign of stopping anytime soon. So even wages for construction workers are making a lot of progress. All right, how about the green horseman? Death and disease, how's he doing? This is mortality from infectious disease and cardiovascular disease, and this is the United States in the 20th century, so 1900 to the present. You see infectious disease um, has a spike, that's the Spanish influenza right there, and then a massive dip down all the way up into the 2000s. I imagine there's a little bit of a spike from coronavirus in 2020, somewhere around here, but I know that cardiovascular disease deaths still far uh, outpace coronavirus deaths and cardiovascular disease itself, while there was an increase in the first half of the century, has a rapid decline coming into the second half of the 20th century. So even on those two fronts, we're making a whole lot of progress. This is cancer. The blue bars are cancer survivors in each decade, and the red bar is mortality from cancer, people who die from cancer. So again, numbers are looking good. This is child mortality rates going back to the 1800s all the way up to and including 2020. And so as you can see, children under the age of five dying is a fragment of what it once was just a couple hundred years ago. This is life expectancy, global life expectancy. No, I'm sorry, not global. This is just the United States, um, but there is a similar pattern globally. Life expectancy in the United States from 1860, I believe, right up to and including 2020. Yes, there's a little bit of a dip right there, 2019, 2020, but I imagine it's a temporary blip while the pattern keeps on going up. This is really specific. This is New York City, so a very big city, and this is the mortality rate. In other words, all deaths that are not age-related deaths. And you can see in the 1800s, you had some pretty big spikes, and then just a massive decline right up to, and this data includes all of the year 2020. That orange dot at the very end is 2020. So you can see there is a spike upwards of mortality, non-age related mortality in New York City. But if you put it in perspective from uh, the past couple hundred years, we're still nowhere near where we were. Statistically and historically speaking, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are doing a lousy job in almost every single category. The negatives are down and the positives are up. Now that's not to say that we don't still have wars and poverty and disease and death, but we certainly don't have those things to the extent that Zechariah did in the Old Testament and John in the New Testament and even that our great grandparents did. And I think there's a reason for that. I think it's because of the first horseman, the white horseman who rides out in front of the others, Jesus Christ, the bringer of peace and the healer. And if you spend any amount of time looking at a lot of charts and graphs like this that go back as far in history as we have recorded information, I think you will see a trend that the beginning of the decline of all of those things begins around the time that the message of Christ and Christianity begins to spread around the world. And that's because Christianity embodies 
principles like the value of life, love for one's neighbor, and good stewardship of our resources, principles and values that were not emphasized enough before that time. And so Jesus Christ, the horseman who rides out to conquer, is doing exactly that. He's not conquering people or nations. He's conquering sickness and poverty and violence and death. And he is calling us and has been calling us to join him in that fight. And what we have done in all of the intervening years is making a difference. Jesus said to us that the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is growing every day, every year, and every millennium. One last thought. Each of the four horsemen is summoned with a single word. Come. It's an interesting word in its original Greek. It's erhu. It's a command that can mean either to come or to go. Same word for either command. And it's found exactly eight times in the book of Revelation. Four right here with the four horsemen. And remember how important numbers are. Four in the very last chapter of of Revelation, which is the very last chapter of the Bible. And so the God who summons us together and summons the four horsemen is a God of balance. He summons the horsemen, but he also summons us. He sends out the horsemen, and he sends us out as well. I want you to listen to the final summons, the final verses of Revelation. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let everyone who hears say, come. And let everyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. The one who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.